Hallelujah. We thank God for, for the weather. <laughs> it's hot and um, not just hot. I mean, it's good. So we thank God for his grace and mercy that has brought us together tonight um, to learn at his feet. So I want to say good evening to everyone. Good evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us on this um, teaching tonight. Um, throughout this month, throughout this month of June, we are looking at um, the series um, questions of life or questions about life. So there are many questions that arise within our hearts and sometimes we can't find answers to them because we don't know who to ask. We don't know what to say. But tonight, by the special grace of God, you know, as we've been looking at several questions, even from um, the start of this month, we've looked at several questions. So today we're going to look at another question. And so that is, can God change his mind? Or does God change his mind? So can God change his mind? Does God change his mind? So we're going to look at this question um, tonight by the grace of God. So before I go on, I want to ask anyone on this platform tonight, do you believe that God changes his mind? So does God change his mind? Yes or no? If you say yes, I want you to give me, um, I want you to support your answer. And if you say no, why do you think God does not change his mind? Yes, anybody? I would say yes, he does. No, I would say he has. He has changed his mind or he does change his mind? Well, I suppose he does because he has. So can you give me an example of when God changed his mind or your experience of God changing um, his mind? There's a story in the Bible of, um, I can't remember who it is, one, I think it was a king who um, the prophet had gone to say that he was going to, by this time tomorrow or something, you, you, you will die. Well, he wasn't going to live. And then he turned his um, face towards the wall and he prayed um, to God and God extended his life, gave him some more years. Mm. Um, something like that. I can't remember the story exactly. That's but Ezekiah. Yes, that's uh, King Ezekiah. Uh, when God sent um, Prophet Isaiah to him, that he should pack up his bag, he should put his house in order. That um, he should maybe if he hasn't made a will before, <laughs> he mm. should make his will because he was going to die. Yeah. And then the Bible says Ezekiah turned. As soon as he got the message, Ezekiah turned to the wall mm -hmm. and um, he began to pray. Mm -hmm. And not just pray, he began to weep bitterly because mm -hmm. he didn't want to die, mm -hmm. of course. And the Bible says, um, while Isaiah was still in the court of the king, you know, like the long corridor, mm -hmm. so he wasn't yet out of the palace, you know, palaces are usually big. So mm. he was still walking, maybe some meters, because for Ezekiah to pray and uh, for God to say no, go back to him. Um, we see that eventually God said, okay, you know, um, I'm going to add 15 more years. That's right, 15 so more it's like, years. Yeah. And we add 15 more years. And so, <laughs> do you know this question my husband has asked me before? Said, you know, okay, let me, let me look at some other answers on the platform. Sister Fudo says, God is not man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent or change his mind. So, <laughs> it's a very, very uh, interesting thing because to some people they will say, no. God does not change his mind. Some people, they will say, well, with the example that Sister Agnes has cited, that God does change his mind. I mean, sometimes he does. All right. So 
God does not change. Sister Afundo says, God does not change. God is unchanging and unchangeable. He is also all wise. So he cannot change his mind in the sense of realizing a mistake, backtracking or trying a new tact. Okay? Thank you, Sister Afundo. Thank you for that answer. That's but also, our... what about with Moses? Mm -hmm. when he was going to um finish off the children of Israel when he said you know I've had enough of these people <laughs> <laughs> um they're stiff necked and so on and so forth and Moses pleaded with him mm. okay that. okay what about that what about that okay don't worry we are going to look at <laughs> all of this um tonight um all right, if we look at um, the first um, story, yes, God can change his mind. Sister Alin says God can change his mind. Ninef and Jonah, okay. Okay, all of you are wonderful because uh, almost everything I've written down here, you're already, you already saying it. But we're going to look at it from um, the two angles. That was why I said, if you believe God can change his mind, that you should give me um, an explanation. And if you believe, God does not change his mind. At least two people have said God changes. God can change his mind. Yes, God does change his mind and with explanation. And then someone is saying, no, God does not change his mind. I like the way Sister Fundo puts it, that God does not change. He's not a God of mistake. So he, he doesn't change his mind because he has made a mistake. But we can see for some people that say God does change his mind, we will see that in such occasion, it wasn't as if God made a mistake. You know, um, we will see the reason why God does change his mind. Sometimes when he does, when he changes his mind. Okay, so let's first of all look at um, the fact that God does not change his mind. Um, in the sense that he's, he doesn't change his mind like a human being that will say, oh, I realize I made a mistake. So because of that, I'm changing, I'm changing my mind. So let's look at some scriptural basis to see on what occasion or what causes a change of mind. Is it actually a change of mind? And when we say God does not change his mind, why should we say it's Because we're going to look at both. We're analyzing the two tonight and we're going to have scriptural basis. So we're going to look at the occasions where God changes his mind. What caused it? Or did he actually change his mind because he made a mistake? No. So we're going to look at all of this um, tonight by the grace of God. Okay. So let's open to Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. The book of Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. I want someone to read for us. Any Bible version we do. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19. All right. If you are there, please read. Read for us, please. Anybody? Numbers 23, 19 reads, Yes. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. At he said, and shall he not do it? Or at he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Mm -hmm. 20. No, 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 no. Just 19. Right. Thank you. God is not man. That is your lie. And that was what Sister Fundo quoted. The Bible verse, Sister Fundo quoted. God is not found, Numbers 23, 19. That is your lie. I mean, we're going to look at the scriptures. So God is not man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent, that he should change his mind. As he said, and we need not do it. Please, I want you to take notes of certain key words here. So that you don't say, but why? Did the Bible say God changes is my, I mean, why did we have occasions when God changed, excuse me, his mind? So this Bible verse says, as he not said, and will he not do it? Or as he not spoken, and will he not make it good and fulfill it? So does anybody want to explain that last part? Anybody? As he not said, and will he not do it? Or has it not spoken and will it not make it good and fulfill it? 
Does anybody want to explain? Does anybody have an understanding of that? Just that last line. Yes, anyone? Has he not said, will he not do it? Or has he not spoken? And will he not make it good and fulfill it? What do you think that passage is referring to? Because it says God does not change his mind. He said he is not man that he should lie. He is not the son of man that he should repent. All right? Yes, anybody? That second line. That what he has said um, doesn't change. What he has said, he said it. He won't, he won't um, take his word back. Mm. So he, he will fulfill. So what, what he has it. said, he doesn't take it back. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Sister Fundo. But, but remember, Sister Agnes said, God said to Isaiah to say to Ezekiah that you are going to die. And God changed his mind. But I want a deeper, I want someone to explain this last bit. Is to it, us. Is mm -hmm. it that it's his words, it's him that um is speaking it. So it's like he will bring it to pass, he will fulfill it. So if he has said it, then it's up to him whether he fulfills it. <laughs> no, no. no, don't don't change it, don't change it. <laughs> Don't change okay. it. <laughs> so uh, yes. like, say for argument's sake, I say to you, um, I'm going to do something for you. Mm -hmm. um, and you reason with me or whatever. And you say, I don't want you to do it for me. Isn't it up to me whether I still do it or not? <laughs> that is, that is if you, because you are man. And the Bible <laughs> says, the Bible is saying that God is not man, mm -hmm. you know? That is, you change what he has said. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, it's, it's not like us. It's not like us. Does anybody else wants to quickly tell us what that bit, what that bit stands for? That last line. Anybody? Does it mean that, good evening, everyone. But good does evening. it mean all things okay. are working together okay. according to his plan and purpose? Um, because if that Bible um, passage, the Amplified Version says that uh, he is not a man that he should lie, not a, a son of man that he should repent, as he said, and he would, and he will he not do it, or as he spoken, and he will he not make it good and fulfill it. So whatever God has said, and that he said he would do is. Um, he has a purpose for it. So every of his words, there is not, there is none of the word of God that is going to go void. That every word that he speaks is still, um, it, ha it has a purpose and it's still according to his plan because he is God. Whereas yeah. with man, we can say things and we just say it and we don't, even, it might not be, we may not have any purpose or, or meaning. We just say things and we, we sometimes change our mind like that. Mm. Mm, okay, thank you, Allah Inka. So what you're saying is there's a purpose behind everything God says. So God is not a purposeless God. He doesn't just say something without a reason behind it. Okay, yes, Sonne, quickly. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Ma. Um, I think Sister Inka has said part of what I was going to say that when God promises something, He does what He promised. So if He speaks that He's going to do something, like this case of Abraham, even in his old age, God brought it to fulfillment. So for me, I would say that when God promises to do something, it's more of the promises of God that he will bring it. And man can say, okay, come for this to, today and tomorrow, they can change their mind. But God is never like that. Wonderful. That was exactly what I was looking for. This Bible verse, verse was referring to God's promises. God's promise is not just what he said. Of course, he said to, um, it wasn't a promise that he made to Ezekiel. That this guy, I look at you, I promise you, you're going to die. No. Because he looked at the sickness and he said to Isaiah, go and say to him, you are going to die. And Ezekiel prayed. But that is different from God's promises. And that is one of the things we are going to look at today. There is a purpose behind his promise. 
And whatever he promises, he cannot change it. He will not change it. We will never find anywhere in the Bible that God will promise someone and he will not fulfill it. So that was why he said we should look at the words very well. He says, will he not fulfill it? So there is something like fulfillment. And what do you fulfill? You fulfill promises. So that is what that so concerning every of God's promises. Every of his promises, they are what? They are yes and amen. It's not man that he will promise you one thing and then say tomorrow, sorry, I don't have the capacity to do it. You know, I cannot do it. And you can't crucify a man for not having the capacity to do something. But God is not, that's why they say God is not man. Whatever promise, whatever word that comes out of his mouth, he will surely fulfill because he has the capacity to fulfill. And if you look at James 1.17, I'm trying to first of all come from the angle of God does not change. Before we look at what can bring about a change in what God says. All right? So because we must not confuse ourselves. The answer to does God, does God change or can God change is yes and no. But we have to look at it from different angles. But I want us to understand something. So if we say God can change, it's not relating to his promises or his covenant. So the Bible says in James 1.17, James 1, 17 says, every good thing, giving, and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation. There is no variation in him. The gift is given you, the promises is made to you. There is no variation in him, all right? And there is no shadow of turning. That is, he is perfect, and he never changes. That is what the Amplified Version says. He never changes. God does not change. But what, in what area that can we say God does not change? Every word, it says every word that proceeds out of my mouth will not return to me void. Every promise, every good and perfect gift, not destruction. <laughs> not every word of destruction. He said every good and perfect gift that comes from the Father cannot change. It does not change. And so, I want us to understand one basic, I mean, there are basic truths I want to bring to us tonight. God does not change his mind about our purpose in life. God does not change his mind about our purpose in life. So when God created you, when you were formed, when you were made, according to that Psalm 139, you know, when you were knitted together in your mother's womb, your purpose has been embedded inside of you. And what God says concerning your creation cannot change. If you ask God 1,000 times, if, you, if, if God shows you something today and you go back to the mountain, you go and pray another 40 years or 40 days or 40 nights, it will not change. The purpose of God, what God says concerning your purpose, concerning your life, because there is no mistake in your creation. All right? There is no mistake in your creation. No one has been mistakenly made. There is no factory return in God's creation. So there is no mistake. So which means everything God says concerning you, if God has shown you something, don't think that he will change his mind and say, well, you know, no, I have created you a prophet. And, but because you don't like it, okay, I will make you, I will turn you and make you a businessman. It's not going to change. So God's word does not change. And that is what you find in Romans 12, 29. I want someone to quickly read. Please, I want us to get our Bibles, you know, beside us because we're going to read a lot of Bible verses. So Romans eleven twenty nine. Romans eleven twenty nine. Please, I want someone to quickly read. God does not change. About God does not change His mind about our purpose, our calling. So whatever He says to you, there is nothing you can do. You, you only have the free will. Like last week, we dealt with free will. Your free will, you know, you have that free will. You have that freedom to choose whether you want to go with it or you don't want to go with it. So now, can somebody read Romans um, eleven twenty nine quickly? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, mm -hmm. for he does not withdraw what he wow. has given, nor does he change his mind about those to, him, to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. Thank you. Thank you. That's the amplified version. Said so the yes. gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. 
he does not withdraw it. He does not change his mind, all right, about those to whom he has given the grace to or those he has sent his call to. So if God is calling you, don't think that you will go and pray, 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 and ask God like Ezekiah because, you know, you can say, Ezekiah prayed, God answered him. Let me tell you, God does not change his mind about his calling in your life, about his purpose. It's not going to change, even if you pray to tomorrow. But you may refuse. You may refuse. You have the free will to refuse to say you don't want to do it. So that, that Bible verse establishes that God's calling and purpose and gifts of concerning us, no, these do not change. Number two, God does not change his mind concerning his word. His word, whatever proceeds out of his mouth, he does not change his mind. You know, even if you say, well, he sent his word to Ezekiah and then says, okay, we add 15 years to your life. Does it mean that Ezekiah will not die eventually? Ezekiah will see that. He just postponed his death. <laughs> he postponed his death. God does not change his mind concerning his word. Psalm 119, verse 89. Psalm 119, verse 89. I want someone to read Psalm Isaiah 45, verse 23. Isaiah 45, verse 23. I want someone to read that to us while I read Psalm 119, 89. Please open to Isaiah 43, Isaiah 45. 23. So Psalm 1989 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled, standing firm in heaven and unchangeable. The word of God is unchangeable. His word is it is settled. Whatever he says, whatever he decrees, that is what we come to pass. It does not change. So is anybody in um Isaiah 45, verse 23? I have sown. And all by myself, the mm. word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. Mm. That to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. He said, I have sworn by my name. So whatever God swears with, whatever God promises, whatever comes out of his mouth, he said, that word that proceeds out of my mouth will not return to me void. So when God attaches covenant to his word, it does not change. That word will never, ever change, no matter what anybody says. That is the reason why we must hold on to the word of God. Because if we serve a God who, who change, whose word changes, because he does not have the power to back up his word, then what is the basis of our faith? What is the foundation of our faith? If we serve a God who can promise, who can send a word to us, and then he will say, sorry, I didn't mean it. No. There is no reason why we should follow him. But because his word is sure forever, we can depend on his word. We can depend on his good promises concerning us. It does not change. That it will not change. And so I want to also submit to us that God does not change his promise, his covenant. It does not change. I want someone to read Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. Hebrews 6, 18. I want someone to quickly read that. Um, to us, Hebrews 6, um, 18. God, Isaiah. Isaiah is Isaiah 43, verse 23. Isaiah 45, verse 23. Isaiah 45, verse 23. Now can someone read Hebrews 6, 18. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. God does not change his promise. God does not change his covenant. It doesn't change. So is anybody in Hebrews 6, 18? Hebrews 6, 18. So that so that by two unchangeable things, his promise mm. and his oath, mm. in which it is impossible for God to lie. Mm. We who have fled to him for refuge would have strong encouragement and enduring strength to hold tightly to the hope set before us. Thank you. We said so it is impossible. Please let's underline that word. It is impossible for God to lie. For we know that his promise and his vow, his vow means his covenant will never change. Will never change. Alright? So, God does not change his mind concerning his promise, concerning his covenant. It does not change. It cannot change. It does not change. And it says to us in Psalm 89, 
Psalm 89, verse 34 to 35. Psalm 89, verse 34. To, it says, my covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, my vow which cannot be violated, I will not lie to David. All right? So he said, my covenant I will not violate. I will not change it. I won't change it for anything. Once I have sworn with my mouth. So to those, we will see that to those, you know, who experience, you know, these changes in their life, maybe God sent a prophet to them and something changed. It wasn't a sworn covenant. When God, if you look at the Bible, every, the Bible says every of God's promises are what? Yes and amen. So you can hold on tight to his word because the covenant, the word that worked for the people in those days are still working today. If you can enter into covenant with him, he does not lie and he cannot repent. He cannot change his mind. He's not a, a son of man that will say, sorry, I don't have power to do it. So he, he says, my covenant, I will not utter. Every word that proceeds out of my lips, I will not change. I will not change it. And so Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Malachi 3, 6 says, for I am the Lord. I do not change. I remain faithful to my covenant with you. That is why all you, all sons of Jacob, have not been consumed. That is why you have not been consumed, because I am faithful. The faithfulness of God will not make him change his mind concerning his covenant, concerning his promises for us. His faithfulness will not make him change his mind. So I want you to hold on tight to it. Malachi 3, 6. God says, I do not change. I do not change. I don't change my covenant with you because I am faithful. I am loyal. I am committed to you. I do not change. All right? And I also want to submit to us that the eternal decrees of God do not change. So we will look at what changes, like I said before. We look at what changes. But I'm talking about things, what God says that cannot change. It's eternal decrees cannot change. Eternal decrees. What are eternal decrees? When I talk about eternal decrees of God, that is what God has decreed from the foundation of the earth, from the foundation of the world, till the world comes to an end, they will not change. They will not change. Can let me give you exact? I mean, let me give you some explanation of eternal decrees of God. You know, eternal decrees of God are his eternal purpose according to the counsel of his will. That is, by his, for his own glory, he has ordained whatsoever comes to pass. God has ordained them, and they will continue to come to pass because they are eternal decrees. So these decrees are eternal. They are not subject to temporal conditions, nor variable in the light of changing situations. They are not subject to change. These eternal decrees of God, as it was in the beginning, so is now and forever shall be. You know, they are in accordance with God's wisdom, all right? So, and they allow for secondary wills. Sometimes our will, we can decide to agree with this eternal decree, but it does not change it. Our freedom, our free will does not change this will of God. If we say we don't want to do it, we will still go back and do it. Like Jonah. <laughs> like Jonah. When God told Jonah, go to Nineveh. What did Jonah do? Jonah changed, changed course. But that did not change the, the decree of God concerning him. So they do not change. And lastly, they serve God's pleasure. They serve God's pleasure. So which means eternal decrees of God are what we continue, what we stay, what cannot change. Can we give examples of eternal decrees of God on this earth? This earth that will never change as they were in the beginning. So they are now and forever will be. Anybody please? What are the examples of the eternal decrees of God that you have experienced or that you have seen that you know that these decrees cannot change? Anybody? Can I ask a question there? Yes, you please. Know, um, so when Adam and Eve was born and God gave them authority over everything, mm. um, but it, it was taken away from them, no. The authority God gave them because originally they have been made 
in the image of God. You will see that whether you are, uh, what, what was the decree God gave to them? In I am Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28. When he made them, he said, what? Be fruitful, multiply, replenish, yeah, subdue it, have dominion, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That did not change. Right. Never. So whether you believe in God or you don't believe in Christ, <laughs> you will give back to children, isn't it? You will be fruitful. I mean, I just read about um, a, the death of a man today. You know, the father of 89 children and the husband of 34 wives, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you see the whole clan, I said this one, <laughs> they, they, they are in the um, northern part of India. I said these ones are enough to form a city. The eternal, it doesn't matter. You can't go and ask him, are you a Christian? Because Christianity does not determine all of those. We were created in the image of God. When man fell, what, what happened to man was eternal separation from God. But the decree of God concerning us, that has not changed. That has not changed because we are fruitful, we multiply, and you will see that, you know, in terms of subduing the heart, having dominion over it, we are still doing it. So there are eternal decrees of God that do not change. Yes, what examples can we give? So, Sister Agnes, you want to say that is part of the eternal decree of God? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Eternal decrees of God that we see that no matter what, they are not subject to circumstances. They are not subject to, you know, situations. They are not subject to wherever you are. They are eternal decrees of God. Yes? Because God Six said it. Time, harvest time. Seed time, time, harvest, harvest time. time. Thank you. Thank you. That is found in the book of um, Genesis. Genesis. Um, Genesis um, 8.22. Genesis 8, 22, because I have it here. Time and seasons. No matter what, no matter who you are, see time and harvest. Time and seasons will never change until God removes this act and brings another one. But it says, as long as the act remains. So these ones are not subject to whether you are a Christian or you are a non-Christian. You know, rain will fall, sun will shine. When you plant, you will reap. Sea time and harvest, winter and, and uh, summer and spring and whatever, they do not change. They are eternal decrees of God. Yes, anybody else wants to give us an example of eternal decrees of God? They are not subject to us. They, 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 they show the sovereignty of God. Anybody? Well, I was going to say that his unconditional love he still has for us, no matter what. He still loves us and he won't forsake us. Mm, it's unconditional love. God has unconditional love for us. Yes, but his love is still also conditional to some extent. All right? His love is still conditional because Gen I mean, um, John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But what? Whosoever, whosoever believes in him. So God loves us, but that love, we can only enjoy it when we choose to accept it. So that is why the love of God, if someone rejects it, is not available to anybody that rejects it. That's why Jesus says, if you reject, whoever rejects this extension of love, he said, has been condemned already. But for those who accept it, there is that eternal decree that that love is everlasting. That's why the Bible now says, whosoever believes in him will not die, but have everlasting life. So everlasting life for those who receive Jesus is there. All right. Sonny, you wanted to say something? Um. Justice said another one is those that know their God, they shall be strong and they will do exploits. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Daniel 11.32. Those that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So if you don't know God, don't think about exploits. Don't think about exploits because you can easily be swayed away. So quickly, let me give us examples of eternal. We've mentioned some of these. That is, um, time and seasons, time and season, we mentioned that, that the, the decree is there, all right? The sovereignty of God, the sovereignty of God cannot change. 
is it cannot change. In the book of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8 says, But as to the Son, it says to him, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of absolute righteousness. So the throne of God is forever. His kingdom is forever. His sovereignty is forever. It has been decreed by him. He cannot change. No one can overthrow him. No one can overthrow him. The eternal nature, the eternal nature of God, you know, is his eternal decree. He cannot change. Nothing can make God change his nature. You know, some of us human beings, we change our personality, you know, we change our nature based on how people relate to us. So if people are good to us, we can be good. If people are nasty, what will you do? We will be nasty. And although some of us have special grace, even when people are nasty, we may still be good. So, but our nature are subject to change. We are like weather, the British weather, we can change. But God's nature cannot change. His nature is forever. It's his eternal decree. The Bible says in Hebrews 1, 11 to 12, Hebrews 1, 11 to 12, the Bible says, they will perish, but you remain forever and ever. And they will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same forever and your years will never end. God is the same. As he was yesterday, so he is today and forever shall be. That's why sometimes some of the songs we sing, you know, like somebody, we, we sing this song, ancient of days, as old as you are. God is not old. We cannot use the word old to, to him because it's not subject to time and season like us. No, he's not. His eternal decree remains the same concerning himself. The purpose of the heart is also an eternal decree of God. He says, this earth must be inhabited. And nothing, in fact, even if you have a nation that do not know God, they can have 100 children. A person that doesn't know God can have 200 children. So because the earth must be inhabited, it's an eternal decree of God, the purpose of the earth. In the book of Isaiah 45, verse 18, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18, the Bible says he formed the earth. He made it. He established it, and he did not create it to be a worthless waste. He formed it to be inhabited. He said, I am the Lord and no one else. So these are eternal decrees of God. The same thing with salvation. I thought someone would mention salvation. Someone would mention salvation. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, Romans 10, 13, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Shall be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's an eternal decree. Salvation. If you call upon him, if you believe in him, if you trust in him, if you go to him, if you run to him, you will be saved. So he cannot change his mind concerning that. He cannot say, you are black. You know, your forefathers offended me. Now you are running to me. Sorry, I cannot save you. No. He said, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So salvation. It's also his eternal decree. There's eternal decree concerning salvation. Acceptance for everyone who comes to Jesus is eternally decreed. It cannot change. Like I said about salvation. So anybody who comes to Jesus will be saved. And that is what Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 37. John chapter 6, verse 37. Jesus says, all that my father has given me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will not cast out. Anybody who comes. So regardless of the magnitude of your sin, regardless of what you have done, irrespective of your background, whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. So know that um, whoever has um, committed, you know, 1,000 adultery, you are no longer suited for salvation. No, it's an eternal decree of God. You just come. Come as you are. Come the way you are, regardless of your background, regardless of what you might have done, regardless of the condemnation of people concerning you. As far as God is concerned, once you come, it's an eternal decree that you'll be saved. It's just for you to come. And I've told us that eternal decrees of God, so no, 
um, can be affected by secondary will, which means your will. God says whoever comes will not be cast out. But if you don't come, what can he do? But that does, that does not negate the fact that whoever comes to him, he will not cast out. The atoning, uh, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus and the priesthood of Jesus, this cannot change. The blood that Jesus shed <laughs> 2,000 years ago is still working till today. That blood can never stop working because the eternal decree of God is backing it up. The blood that was shed is the blood that is enough to remove sin once for all. Whoever believes in him will receive that atoning, atonement for himself. So it's an eternal decree that God can never change his mind. I'm talking about eternal decrees of God that cannot change. They don't change with situation. They don't change with prayer. They don't change with God, I beg. No, you cannot say, God, this person, he has offended me. Seriously. If he prays to you for forgiveness, Father, don't forgive him. You know, or if he comes to you, he wants to be saved. Father, reject him. Reject him. <laughs> we can say that to our earthly father. We can say that to our earthly mother and say, Mommy, she offended me. Don't open the door for her. Or you offended me. Don't open the door for him. Or you can't say that to God. Because the eternal decree of God is concerning the atonement, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Whoever, whosoever comes. So the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 21. Hebrews 7, I want you to take note of all these things. Because when you understand God, they, they are this family, they will give you a solid foundation for your faith. This knowledge will give you a solid foundation for your faith in God. All right? So that you know that anytime you come to God, the atoning sacrifice and the priesthood of Jesus, which means Jesus standing between us and God, mediating as the high priest, is an eternal decree that cannot change. It can, they cannot appoint another high priest tomorrow. It doesn't, it cannot happen. God cannot bring another high priest tomorrow. We only have one high priest. You can change Pope. Pope can die. They can change Pope. They are Pope can resign. They can change president. They can change pastors. General Basia can change. At least last week, yes, last weekend, I read about Rick Warren. After more than 40 years, I think 41 or 42 years, at um, Saddleback Church in America, he's resigning. He's retiring with his wife. And they said they promised that in starting that job, they will only spend 40 years. Now they spend 40 years. They said they are praying for his replacement, succession. So that is a general overseer. Changing his position. Now looking for somebody to succeed him. But the priesthood of Jesus Christ can never change. It can never ever change. And that's why that Hebrews chapter 7 verse 21. So you can have confidence in the atonement, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. The Bible says, but with Jesus, God affirmed his royal priesthood with his promise, saying, the Lord has made a solemn oath and will never change his mind. You are a king priest forever. <laughs> a solemn oath and will never change his mind. So we can be joyful as believers that the God we serve it's not a God that we look at, at, I mean, and say, sorry, I made a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. In his eternal decrees, he does not make mistakes. And lastly, I thought someone also mentioned it, the eternal decree of God concerning Israel, the nation of Israel. Does anybody want to tell us what is the eternal decree of God concerning the nation of Israel? That is part of the eternal decree of God. It can never change. Anybody? The nation of Israel, Israel. I said this in Israel. Anybody? What is the eternal decree of God concerning the nation Israel? The nation of Israel. Um, was it when God uh, said that Israel is his chosen inheritance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chosen that inheritance? But that still does not make it an eternal decree. Yeah. Yes, Israel is his chosen inheritance. Mm. But I want something more that shows mm. that it is the eternal decree of God concerning Israel. 
Yes, anybody? Is it that although um, in Israel they've been disobedient to God, he's still, they're still the chosen people. And um, obviously the Gentiles are also, we're all one, our Jews and Gentiles, but um, Israel, um, they were the, the chosen people of God and mm. they have moved away from him. They have disobeyed and they're sinners in God's eyes, but he still loves them and he still is waiting that you know they will return to him. Okay. So the love of God, though Israel sings, though Israel does whatever they mean, whatever they do, all right? But like Sister Lene said, they are waiting. God is still waiting for them. But that is, I still want somebody to add to what Sister Lene has said concerning Israel. But as Sunday says, no one will be able to stand against them. Mm, that is not, it's part of it, but it's still not eternal decree of God concerning Israel. Anybody? Is it that um, he will, that they will, um, you know, just like we have salvation, mm -hmm. that, that um, because it says we are grafted into, we are grafted in, they're, they're, the, they're the vine, they're the chosen, aren't they? And we're grafted into, into, into it. The, yeah, so. Salvation. It, yeah, salvation. So salvation is theirs as such. Thank you. I want someone to open to Isaiah 45, 17. Isaiah 45, 17. And another person to open to Jeremiah 31 3. Please let's quickly read Isaiah 45 17, Jeremiah 31 3. You know, we are talking about eternal decrees of God. So, all these things are to tell us that, you know, we have to know in which area of God, in, in the way He is, does He change His mind? We will say the answer is no. It, when it comes to His decrees, His words, His, his promises, His oath, His covenants, it does not change. It's mine. Yes? Anybody? Israel has been saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You will not be put to shame or humiliated for all eternity. And you see, for all eternity, Israel has been saved with what? Everlasting salvation. Everlasting salvation. So that is eternal decree of God concerning Israel said, I have love, you know, Israel I love. Um, Jacob I love. Israel I hate. Nobody can change that. Nobody can change that. It's an everlasting salvation. That is why we are, you know, we are, like Sister Agnes said, our affiliation, our association, you know, we, because that's where Jesus comes from. So there's an eternal salvation. Anybody wants to read Jeremiah 31 3? Jeremiah 31 3. Quickly, it says, The Lord appeared from of old to me, Israel, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you and continued my faithfulness to you. So, no matter what, the salvation of the old, everything about the world history is tied to Israel. It's tied to Israel. So, even the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, everything. Is tied around Israel because you know there is an eternal decree concerning that nation. There is an eternal decree concerning nation. Now we have looked at you know that God cannot change his mind, but on what occasion does God change his mind? Or can God change his mind? We've seen that God does not change his mind concerning his decrees, concerning his promises, concerning his word, concerning his purpose for our life. They will not change. But concerning destruction, <laughs> God can change. Concerning destruction, God can change. Can anybody tell me why you think concerning destruction, God can change? With anything that, if you see occasions where God changed his mind, in the Bible, you will see it has to do with destruction. It has to do with destruction, yes? Anybody? Is it because that's not his heart? That's not his, um, like he's, it says, all that's good and perfect comes from him. Mm -hmm. So he 
you know, he wants good things for us. Mm. He's not a God of um, destruction as such. He's um, a good, good father. Yeah. It's a good, good sign. Is it also... Um, yes, okay. Sister Anna. Um, if, he, if he may decree something about a person, for example, the, the one example that comes to mind is Saul in the Bible. When he made him king, he made him king. He gave him the kingship of Israel. But mm. when he turned away, God mm. changed his mind concerning him and what he would give him. Mm. Because and he... So, yes. Thank you. He turned away. He attracted destruction into his life. It wasn't God's intention that, you know, he would be destroyed. But he attracted destruction and God gave him a leeway. God gave him an opportunity to repent. Yet, he was still stubborn and he continued in his stubbornness. Till he could no longer refer to God as his God. He was telling the prophet, honor me before the Lord your God. Not my, you know, he didn't say God was his God. So God gave him an opportunity, yet, you know, he did not take that, that way. Because God would not want any to perish. That's what the Bible says. He doesn't want any to perish. Yes, somebody wants to say something else? Was it Sunday? Why, what can make God change is mind. I want us to quickly open. It's a merciful God. It's a merciful God. Hallelujah. It's a merciful God. If you look at, you know, the sin of David and the sin of Saul, in human terms, you will say, ah, David did something more terrible. What David did was more terrible than what Saul did. So we will say Saul was disobedient. David, in fact, do you know what Prophet Nathan, Nathan said to David? He said, you are giving the enemy of God an occasion to speak blasphemy. An occasion to, to say, ah, but this is he not this man that God says is after his heart. Look at him. Look at him taking another person's wife and killing the husband. He said, God, Nathan said, God said you have given the enemy of God an occasion to speak evil concerning God. But David, what did he do? He repented. He repented. He started begging and begging and begging because, you know, there is no father that will want his son or his children to perish. I'm not talking about a crazy mother or a father that is out of their mind, but I'm talking about anybody in their right mind, growth in their right mind. There's no parent that will want anything to touch. Even if, you know, I, I, I love this, um, this, um, why say, I mean, it's one of the, I mean, he says the mother's love is like a tube of toothpaste. Is never quite all gone. That is, if you are still pressing it, you still find some little foam there. The mother's love. So God, you know, loves us because he's both our mother and father. He would never, ever want us to perish. He doesn't want any to perish. So that is what, on that occasion, when you appeal, when you repent, he will change his mind. When you appeal, when you repent, Will obedience be an instance by Abraham? What do you mean by that, Anna? Will obedience be an instance by Abraham? God will, is a compassionate father. Yes, Anna, what did you mean? What did you say? Oh, sorry, there's another Anna. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We have two Annas. So, Sister Anna, you said, will obedience be an instance by Abraham? So, what did you mean by that? Do you want to um, explain further, Sister Anna? Because I didn't get, I didn't quite get what you wrote in this. Okay. So, hello. hello yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, I can't hear. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not sure if I got your question correctly, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you, if I got it correctly, um, you said. When will God change his mind? Yes, God what can make God ourselves. change his mind? Yes. Abraham uh, was going to sacrifice his son. And mm -hmm. that to me is destruction, destroying mm -hmm. the life of his son. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so I, and I God said, don't. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I can't hear you. But... 
And God said, don't destroy Isaac. God, God did not allow him to destroy Isaac. Can you hear me? I can can anyone you. hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay. So, um, for as, as we, if you look at um, Abraham's case, it was a test. For Abraham's case, it was God wanted to test his faith. God, and not just test. You know, because God would just know that God did not know that Abraham loved him or Abraham would obey. But God wanted to use him as a stamp, you know, as an example of obedience. All right? So don't say that. Why did God test him? Didn't God know that he would obey? Of course God knew he would obey. But God didn't want his obedience and his blessing to be an assumption. He wanted to put a physical, a spiritual, and everlasting stamp so that everybody knows. The Bible says Abraham obeyed and it was credited to him as righteousness. So it wasn't an assumed obedience. It was a practical obedience. So, and God said, you know, it wasn't that God wanted um, Isaac to be destroyed, but it was a test of his faith. So God can change his mind, especially in relation to destruction, not in relation to his promise, not in relation to his eternal decree, not in relation to his purpose for your life, not in, not in relation to his covenant, but in relation to destruction. So that's why we will see occasions when God changed his mind because people repented. You know, even when people did not repent, maybe the people had an intercessor, as in the case of Moses. Moses interceded for the people. That's why we need to intercede for people. We need to intercede. We need to intercede for nations. Nations can experience the full wrath of God. Nations can experience what? The full wrath of God in natural disasters, in so many things. But when we intercede, we can avert evil. We can, because sin is a sinker. When you sin, you are attracting destruction. But when you live in righteousness, you are attracting all the promises of God. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. So the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33. Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 11. I want a fast reader to read. Please, a very fast reader to read Ezekiel 33, verse 11, and then verse 13 to 16. A very fast reader, please read. Any Bible version we do. Ezekiel, chapter 33, 33. Verse 11 and verse 13 to 16. We will see an occasion that can make God change his mind. Anybody? Who is there? Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel is in the Old Testament quickly. Yes, anybody? Ezekiel 33, 11. 11, then from verse 13 to 16. So from 11 first. Okay. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? 13 to 16. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, but he mm. trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, none of his righteous works shall be remembered. Mm. But because of the iniquity that he has committed, he shall die. Again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. If he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen and walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has Amen. done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Amen. Amen. Can you see? God says, I have no pleasure. In the death of any sinner. So what God, God in, in the occasion that can make God change his mind is when a sinner repents. Even though he might have told them that you are going to die. But when the sinner repents, genuine repentance, I'm not talking about because God sees the mind. God sees the mind. Genuine repentance. Like David said in Psalm 51 verse 17. Psalm 51 verse 17 says, a contrite act. You will not reject, oh God. So God says, if I say to the sinner, you are going to die. He, he said it. If I say, you sinner, you are going to die. He said, if that sinner repents, I will forgive him. He will not die again, which means I will change my mind because I do not want any to perish. He said, but if I say to the righteous, you will live. And the righteous now thinks, ah, God says I will live. And now begins to commit sin. He said, mm, that I will change my mind. 
concerning that uh, former righteousness. Because now that person is insane. That is why as Christians, we have to be very careful. You know, not to think that, oh, grace is covering everything. Now I am in Christ. I have grace. I can commit any, any grace, any doctrine of grace that tells you that once you are saved, you can go back and you have already sealed your faith. You can go back and do whatever you like. You know, commit sin, do anything as you like. That is a wrong doctrine. Because the Bible says, if the righteous comes back from his righteousness, though I have told him you are going to live, but you must have to do evil. You are taking God to be a liar. You are, you are, you want to handicap God. Some people with their faith, with this doctrine of grace, they think they can handicap God. So they can put chains on his, on his hands to say, God has said, I am saved. So I can do whatever I like. No, 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 no. He is not going to contradict himself. He will not contradict himself. But when he changes his mind, though he has pronounced judgment and he changes his mind, is because of repentance. Because of repentance. When you look at, you know, Jonah, in the book of Jonah, you know, Jonah, if you read the story of Jonah, the whole of the book of Jonah, but if you go to Jonah chapter 3, verse 9 to 10, when Jonah went to Nineveh, Jonah was proclaiming, you guys, in, in 40 days or in 10 days, God says he's going to burn down this city. God is going to send fire and bring some. And he was proclaiming. What happened? The Bible says the king of the city called a national fast, a, a nationwide or citywide fast. And they all fasted for several days. They saw the face of the Lord and God repented. God didn't kill them. Then Jonah was angry. Jonah was angry. He said, you see now, what did I say? You know, you make me a liar. I have gone there to tell them that you will destroy them. Now you don't destroy them. Now, God now gave him a lesson. If you read that, um, can somebody open to Jonah chapter 4 verse 2 quickly, please? Jonah chapter 4 verse 2. Jonah chapter 4 verse 2 and verse 10 to 11. The book of Jonah chapter 4 verse 2, verse 10 to 11. Anybody quickly please read for us. Jonah chapter 4 verse 2, and then 10 to 11. Yes, ma'am. Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. Mm. So he prayed. So he prayed. Lord, didn't I say before, before I left home that this is just what we will do? That's why I did my best to run away to Spain. I knew that you are a loving and merciful God, always patient and always kind always ready to change your mind and not to punish. That's mm. right. So nine, have you read 10 to 11? Okay, 10 to 11 now. Mm. So 10, 10 says, the Lord said to him, this plant grew up in one night and disappeared the next. You didn't do anything for it and you didn't make it grow. Yes, mm. he's so sorry for it. How much, how much more then should I should I have pity on Nineveh, that, that great city? After all, it has more than 120,000 innocent children in mm. it, as mm. well as many animals. Mm. Amen. Can you see now? Can you see? Jonah was blaming God. I know you are merciful. I know you are kind. When people beg you, you will easily listen. And God now taught him a lesson. Because God, you know, Jonah, Jonah, I am was hiding behind a plant. The plant was very beautiful in the morning. When sun came, the plant died, you know, withered away. And Jonah was angry that, ah, look this plant. Why did you wither away and you allow sun to beat me? And God said, look at you. You are angry because of an ordinary plant that you did not make. You did not create it. All right? You didn't make it. You didn't create it. And this plant dies and you are angry. So what about me? I created all the people in Nineveh. At least they have 120,000 children and women, excluding men, and they have innocent animals. So you want me to destroy the city because some people have sinned? You, and when they cry to me, you don't want me to listen. So God was saying, I made them. There is no one that we make something and you want that thing to be destroyed. So God can change his mind when it's a matter of destruction. He does not want any to perish. That's what 2 Peter 3 9 says. He said he does not want anybody to perish, but he's waiting for us to come to him. We don't want to get to a point that, you know, there is no, there is no coming back again. 
We don't want to go far into the world till there is no, no, no return. We don't want to reach that point of no return. Look at the prodigal son. The prodigal son got to a point, the Bible says, he came back to his senses and he said, I will return to my father. So even though he has gone wild, he has spent all his inheritance, he had become poor. He was in abject poverty, but he came to his senses and he went back and the father forgave him. That is our God. That is our God. That's our God. So God can change his mind when it has to do with, because he doesn't want any life to be destroyed. He will still give you chances, second chance, third chance, until if that person, you know, God forbid, if they die in their sin, that's the end. That's the end. But concerning God's decree, promises, you know, his word concerning our lives, he will not change his mind. First Timothy 2.4. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4 says, God desires all people to be saved. Everyone, everyone to be saved. He desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge and recognition of divine truth. Can anybody tell me what prophet in the Bible was moving God to change his mind? <laughs> Does anybody want to remind us what prophet in the Bible or maybe what person in the Bible was moving God to change his mind. Hezekiah. Jeremiah. Hezekiah, God did change his mind because it has to do with death. God said, yeah. I've added 15 more years. But if yeah. you read the story of Hezekiah very well, you will see that when he begged God, God said, pack your load, you will die. If you want to die. And God added 15 years because he was begging and crying and God is a merciful God. Okay, you don't want to come to me now? Okay, no problem. Let me give you extra 15 years, you know? And so it was only that 15 years that he gave back to, to a son called Manasseh. Manasseh was 12 years old when Ezekiah died, which means Ezekiah gave back to Manasseh three years after God told him that he would die. But Manasseh became one of the most evil kings in Israel. Very, very evil. So if Ezekiah had gone, when God told him, pack your bag, let's go, he would not have given back to Manasseh. Manasseh was very evil. All right? So somebody mentioned Jeremiah. Somebody mentioned Jeremiah. Sister Lineage, you said Timothy, please. What happened to Timothy? Okay, First Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Do we remember the story of Balaam in the Bible? The story of Balaam in the book of um, yeah. a book of Numbers, Verse. Numbers chapter twenty-two, verse one to twenty-one. If you if you you can read that Bible verse later, that chapter, Numbers twenty-two one to twenty-one, we see the story of Balaam. Balak went to him, say, "Please, cause cause the people of Israel, cause these people. I don't know. There are too many." You know, please cause them because he knew that Balaam had some power to cause people. He now said, cause them. And Balaam said, ah, I'm going to pray. And we asked God if God wants me to cause them or not. He prayed. In that Numbers 22, he prayed and God said, don't cause them. Because that people you are looking at, that Israel, <laughs> they are saved with an everlasting salvation. No one can cause them. There are people that have been blessed. I, I blessed them. And I even swore to them. It was not an ordinary blessing. It was a covenant I had with their fathers. So don't cause them. And then the following day, the messengers came. Balaam told them, sorry, God told me that I should not cause these people. You know, I cannot cause them, you know, and, and so on and so forth. But when the messengers got to Balak, the king, they said, let's double the gift. Let's double the money. Let's double the honorarium. Let's give him, you know, let, maybe let's put cart on it. Let's put uh, houses. Let's, the, the, king was bring, the king brought double gifts to Balaam. When they came the second day, Balaam saw all the gifts said, wow. Just to cause people, all these gifts said, wait, wait, wait tonight. Let me ask God again. <laughs> let me ask God again, you know, whether you can cause the people. You can see foolishness. Foolishness. He, he, do you know that it was Balaam who said in that Numbers 23 verse 19, 
that God does not change his mind. So he knew that God does not change his mind. God will not change his mind. He said, I have blessed these people. He was a prophet. He knew that whoever, whatever God says concerning his covenant, his promise, he does not change. He now felt that maybe he would change God's mind. So he went the other night. He said, God, you know, Father, check all these gifts out now. Check them out. How can I lose all these gifts? Please change your mind. Let me go and cause these people. You know, and God said, okay, that's what you want to do. You go. But you know that eventually, when he wanted to open his he accepted all the gifts. He was greedy, covetousness. And he thought that God was the same as him. But God looked at him. God said, okay, go. On the, when he got there, God changed his tongue. God, God said, I'm the one that created your tongue. I know what you, I, it, it's, it's what I asked you to say, that you will say. So against his will, against his wish, because Israel has been saved with an everlasting salvation. That's why Numbers 23, 23 says, there is no divination against Israel. There is no enchantment against Israel. And we are the present Israel. When we stay in the will of God, when we follow our shepherd, our Lord Jesus Christ, we are the present Israel. There is no divination against you. There is no enchantment. Let anybody open their mouth to say they curse you. <laughs> no matter what anybody says, there is no one that can curse me. There is no one. There is no one. There is no divination against me. There is no enchantment against me. So you must believe that concerning yourself. God is not going to change his mind concerning you. For somebody to say, let me go and curse her. Let me go and curse him. Let me go and bring trouble to his life. As long as you, as you dwell in the light, as long as you dwell in the purpose of God for your life, hey, you are loved with an everlasting love. You have everlasting life. No one can give you everlasting destruction. No one can destroy you. So at the end of the day, Balaam knew that God would never change his mind concerning his promises, concerning his covenants. So are you here tonight? And you are doubting. You are doubting God's promises for you. You are doubting God's covenant. Please, I want you to understand that God will never change his mind. He is not man that will change his mind. But if you are far away, you are far gone from the Lord, and the devil is telling you, even if you go back, do you think he will accept you? I want you to know that God will change his mind by removing destruction from your life and giving you life everlasting. So God changes his mind when it comes to destruction because he doesn't want you to be destroyed. So do not believe the lie of the devil that tells you you are far too gone. You are far too gone that if you return, God will not, God will not listen to you. If God could take the prodigal son back after all that he has done, tonight God will change his mind concerning you. There will be no destruction for you. There will be no destruction. There is no enchantment against you. And if you are already in the Lord, and the devil wants to, you know, the devil wants to deceive you to disbelieve the promises of God. The promises of God are for you. His covenant is concerning you. He said, I will not change it. If you follow me, if you know me, you will do exploits. If you follow me, if you call upon me, you shall be saved. So can we begin to ask the Lord, Father, give me the faith that stands sure for life, the faith in you, the faith in your immutability, the faith in your unchangeability, the faith in you that you can never change. You can never change concerning your purpose, concerning your calling for my life, concerning your words, concerning your covenant, concerning your promise, God, you will not change. The covenant of peace, he said, my covenant of peace, I will not take from you. God's covenant of peace is yours. God's covenant of joy is yours. God's covenant of everlasting life is yours. God's covenant of victory is yours. God's covenant of salvation is yours. Can you begin to pray and say, Lord, all for the faith that will stand the test of time, that will make me to follow you, believing that you are the immutable God, that you do not change. You are too faithful to change, to, to move in your covenant with me. You are too faithful to fail. You are too faithful to fail. Can you begin to give thanks to that God and say, Lord, give me the faith that will stand firm forever. Give me the faith that will stand firm and unchanging faith. If your faith is unchanging, then you can be sure that all God's promises for you are yes and amen. Pray for an unchanging faith, an immutable faith, that you will stand firm in Him. 
Stand firm in this unchangeable God. Unchangeable God. Unchangeable God. Father, we stand firm in you. We ask for the grace to continue to stand firm in you, O oh Lord, in that name of Jesus Christ. For all those who have gone far away from you, Lord, and they are thinking, can God have mercy again? The word of God says, return to me and I will return to you. If I've said a, a sinner will perish, if that sinner repents, I will not destroy him. That is the word of God. You see, have chance as long as you are living. You have that chance to return to God. Can you come back to God and say, Lord, I give you my life. I return to you. Forgive me all my sins. Forgive me, oh God. Forgive me, I return to you. Because you said, if I return to you, if I call upon your name, you will save me. And that word of God is a decree. It can never change. So I want you to say his word back to him and say, Lord, you have said it. You have said it that if I return to you, you will save me. Therefore, I come to you, Lord. Father, save me. Father, save me. Begin to rededicate yourself to God. Rededicate yourself in faith, in obedience, in following. Rededicate yourself to him in the name of Jesus. And all that he has said concerning you, they are for you. He says these promises are for you and for your children and children's children forevermore. And I want you to begin to decree to your life right now. If there's any area of your life you need God to touch, remember his promises. Is he health? He says, I will restore health unto you. That is his promise. Can never change. It can never change. You know, is it, is it victory you need? He says, I will fight against those who fight against you. He said, I will save you. I will save your children. You know, whatever you need, there are promises of God that you can stand upon. And I have told you by two immutable things through which God cannot lie. He does not lie. It is we that change. God does not change. It is we that, you know, we doubt. We are the ones who doubt, who doubt God's promises. God does not change. If you stand in his promises, they are yes, they are amen. I want you to reaffirm your faith. I want you to confess God's promises concerning your life, concerning that situation concerning that situation, and he will surely do it. If you need God's promises, you need me to, to look for God's promises for you, whatever the situation you might be passing through, send me an email. Send me an email at info at domain.org. Info at domain.org. You know, send me an email. Or you can put, uh, you can write on the Facebook page, whatever, it's, look for enemies to send me whatever. If you need God's promises concerning any situation you are going to let me know. And I will give you loads, loads of God's promises. But your faith must anchor on these promises that God does not change. It does not change. It's not man that it will change. Father, we thank you. Because your immutability is what we rely on. You told us in the book of Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. You said, because I do not change. You all, you, all house of Israel, have not been consumed. Because you do not change, oh God, we are rest assured. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. When we go to bed at night, we know because you do not change, we can sleep and we will wake up. Because you are the God that makes us dwell in safety. Father, when we go on a journey, because you do not change, we can rest on your word that says you will protect our going out and our coming in. Father, because you do not change, when we are sick, or the enemy wants to visit us with sickness, we can rest upon your promises that say you will bring health and cure to us. Father, we can rest on that. That you are the God that heals us. Father, every of your promises concerning us, they are yes and amen. So we thank you, our unchangeable God. Lord, our immutable God, ever faithful, ever true, ever just. So you be all the glory. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen, amen, amen in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And if God is giving you a warning, according to Sister Fundo here, if God is giving you a warning of change, please change your way and follow God. Follow God. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. Be obedient to him. And you will see that you will enjoy him. You will enjoy all his promises because they are yes and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for joining the um, Bible study tonight. I believe you have been blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. It, does anyone have any, our time is fast spent, but if you